So guys, everyone, um, thank you for coming here. I'm Luis, and I'm from Brazil, uh, Porto Alegre especially. Um, it's a really long flight from here, right to Amsterdam, Netherlands, 10 hours flight. Uh, I'll t start talking a little bit about my, um, my start in 3D and everything. I, uh, my parents always incentivated me into the arts, especially um, since a early age. This is a picture of me in 99. Um, and I always liked uh, improvising, especially creating things. Due to that, um, I was presented to a friend of mine, a uh, long-term friendship, uh, that started teaching me drawing classes when I was nine. And back on that day, uh, Blender was really um, new. The, the version was 2.3, you know. And I was always really creative, you know. And he said to me, well, uh, there is a new dimension that you can transfer that, I think, uh, as there is a new art medium. Uh, not totally new, but I think this is, this is a better opportunity. It's a pathway future. Um, and he introduced me to Blender in 2007 as a mistake, actually. Um, as he, Blender, as you can see, like back in 2007, you wouldn't mind like it would be softer to be introduced into for kids, right? Especially 10 year old kids, five year old kids. Um, and for him introducing me to Blender in such an early age, I, for some motive um, or a divine explanation, lost the um, uh, a structure or how can I say, uh, back face uh, or a, a structured mindset of a adult program or a program that uh, a software that's for for adults, right? And this is my, my beginners. I started uh, since an early age um, uh, wanting that to tell visual engaging stories through, through content, visual content, you know. Um, and 3D modeling allowed me to that. I evolved with time. Um, those are like my early works uh, to more recent works here. And that path took me around 10 years until right now when I'm, I'm doing freelance for uh, games, problem majority, and also um, developing some add-ons for Blender uh, as well. And uh, I quite transcended the, the drawings I, back, I used to do as a kid. And now, uh, this is all Eevee, by the way. Um, everything real time. Uh, how, tell me, raise your hand, who's familiar with Marvel's Moon Knight? Uh, okay, no one, that's okay, yeah, it's one of the, the most uh, under, underground Marvel characters back from the 70s, and there is his original design, it's this one here, it's this one with the cape. Um, so I decided as a personal uh, project as well to revamp this character uh, to a more uh, newer look because Moon Knight especially has a problem. He has a really good lore, uh, a really good origin story in Egypt, for, for those of you that don't know. And he has powers that's related with his uh, Egypt um, curse, you know. Uh, however, his his custom design didn't translate that at all, you know. So I I revamped the character to a more unique look. This is uh, of course uh, some concept art I did, and also of course some more generalist work uh, or as a creature design, and also um, experimenting with organic forms. Uh, the the SSS from subsurface scattering from EVs. Really great, I'm loving it so far. And uh, a more recent work uh, that was a game pitch for uh, a mobile game. And they had a really, uh, they needed to animate it, uh, 
uh, they need me to create these characters for, for their game. Uh, however, let's, let's div talk, uh, dive into more specific talks here. Learning curves versus artistic development. Um, as a perception, I, I think, I don't know if you guys, certainly, for starting in 3D modeling especially, you have a really uh, progressive learning curve. And what I notice is most users uh, coming from Macs, Maya, and any other software, because they know the basics, their learning curve is uh, actually a little bit more accentuated. Uh, they know, oh, so this term is the exact term to, in Blender, and they can pick up faster because they know the exact, uh, the, the convenient tool that translates into Blender for that. Uh, however, uh, what nobody knows is that um, this, this graph is, is not as uh, perfect as the graph seems. We are constantly looking, searching, and uh, learning new tasks, and learning new softwares to uh, uh, build up on our artistic workflow, you know? So what's the view? What's, what moves us to, to these new processes, new, new tasks, and new... Um, learning new things. Well, there's a, really, there's a quote I, I love, uh, which called, uh, every child is an artist. The problem is how to remain an artist once we grow up. And this is from, from Picasso, of course. And I find that to be especially true in our, in our art. 3D is a really complicated medium. We, have, we, we get lost, uh, especially a lot in the technique but um, especially for beginners, uh, they want to know, want to learn things fast. They want to learn thing, how to do things fast. And with the years, you kind of lose this uh, connection with your uh, artistic intent, your artistic uh, motivation. You know, you're, you start doing things just because of the sake of the tool and not because of the uh, intent itself, um, especially. Uh, another, just another fun thing here with another character. Um, so that it comes down to the title of this um, presentation. By the way, I elaborate this mindset, let's say uh, methodology for myself, in which I started developing some habits for my artistic workflow um, and how to keep creativity flowing in a, a more precise way. This is what I like calling a rising design. It's a, it's a design uh, that I did when I was five years and I encourage you guys to do the same sometimes. Uh, it's nothing new. Uh, take a drawing from your nephew, your cousin, something that he admires, and give, give them a present. Um, model his, his uh, drawings from his childhood in 3D. For a childhood, this is uh, really convenient. And a striving design is exactly that. Uh, it's, it's your trajectory. It's your 10 years or five years of uh, learning all these tools, you know. You're building your, your skills, you're building, you're knowing how things work. And we are all doing, we are all in this path to get uh, into a thriving design. So a little uh, funny thing here with the T and the H, just um, replacing these letters, we get a thriving design. And what I, I want really to accentuate in this talk is we are constantly fighting between these two hemispheres of our, our brain. We have our intent, we have a passion, RC, uh, along with the ideation, planning, and technique, and we're constantly looking at that. So pre-built intent and assigning meaning. Um, a child's drawing, uh, it's what I like calling a Truism. Sometimes uh, you draw because you find that cool, but you not necessarily draw because you have a story behind it. You have a, a assigned meaning. And 
this, this all comes down to a term we we talk a lot here, which is pipeline, right? Where um, studios, we all talk about pipeline. Um, pipeline is is words, uh, a series of tubes, and if we replace it for a word such as vision, you can build some um, four axis uh, matrix from what are really the purpose of uh, a establishing a production workflow that, that is su successful. You have skills, you have purpose, you have time and originality. Well, the skills are not a temporal. And by a temporal, I mean they uh, they lack in time, they become obsolete. However, purpose and originality may not. And we are constantly fighting back between them and trying to achieve a balance in all these four uh, uh, quadrants, per se. Uh, this is uh, a friend of mine, uh, Saito. I I talked with him and say, hey man, um, there is a work of you um, that I really think it would be excellent to showcase in the conference uh, because you're really diving into procedural. We have been playing with procedural things lately. It's a trend, right? And he has this work here, which I find quite fascinating to explain a little bit what I'm trying to talk, uh, to explain for you guys. Uh, you have the the design for design, but uh, design and not intent. The, this is a totally procedural ship that he created in um, in Houdini. And in Blender, per se, uh, for you to have in interesting shapes, uh, you have three common things. You, you, you have no easily recogn recognizable patterns, uh, no intentional layout breakups, and evenly, evenly distributed color harmony. Uh, as you can see, those are interesting shapes. The, they catch your eye when combined. Uh, diving a little bit for the more technical talk. Um, this is a, a really good add-on from another friend of mine, Mark Kingsnord. Uh, he developed this uh, first uh, like uh, random shape generator for us to not start with mainly uh, primitives that we are familiar with, cubes, spheres, cylinders. So you start based on something totally random. And that for a creative side is fantastic. It's really good to, for first level of detail uh, and silhouette. And complex primitives, of course. Um, with that, I built uh, a kit batch set with over 100 parts that I could combine together and also, uh, they all have pre-made UV maps. So I, I don't need to struggle with UVs uh, sometimes. Sometimes, yeah, sometimes no, you know. And you build up, and it's a really interesting thing to combine, like playing with Legos. So uh, design-driven dri story is different story-driven design. Is, w is one better than the other? I don't, uh, I don't know, I think, um, a de design-driven story or a story-driven design, uh, they, both, they both need to coexist so we, so we can uh, create things. Uh, in, in certain things, they are not functional and discover functional reliability in these forms and um, the vice versa. The, there's this another add-on, Setflow by Benjamin Sauder, which is really great to uh, inter, uh, average the spacing between the loops. And uh, this is a feature I really like to be implemented by default in Blender. I use it uh, a lot in a game dev pipeline. Also, Bezier Mesh Shaper by Rafael Navega, especially because I used to use curve modifiers, so I had to create a curve, assign that to a, a cylinder, and merge them, you know. With this add-on, it allows you to just select two points of your mesh, and it automatically creates the, the bezier for you. So it's more 
it's less steps, you know, from your, for your workflow. And of course, the, the Bevel shader from Google Summer of, Summer of Code from, um, I think, 2017. Um, and man, it's really good. I, I really liking it, especially to bake down um, and create these kind of yelled scenes between two floating objects. Uh, as well, I'm, I'm developing my own set of Pi menus to assist with, because uh, Blender is excellent in the primary tools, and I think uh, the only thing we need to improve is UX. I think uh, sometimes you get accustomed with a, a line of thought, and these Pi menus I'm creating is more just the tools I use more often to be uh, in the, the same um, Pi menu. I, my workflow is the following. I create a object space normals, then I uh, convert this object space normal into a tangent space normal, uh, mostly because you, it's a less of a hassle to create, um, and you get cleaner, cleaner things. And after that, of course, painting, diffuse, extracting, ambient occlusion, and things like that, uh, mostly Blender. This is a screenshot from Eevee, so real time as well, and the final result. And to finalize this, uh, I really like this quote also from Andy Warhol, uh, in which he says everyone would be famous for 15 minutes uh, in the future. And that's not true, uh, nowadays we can now have if you put your effort, you can have more than 35,000 uh, minutes. So I truly believe that originality lives in unintentional, humble thoughts. Um, I think as 3D artists in our profession, we need to uh, stay with that uh, mindset always with us, otherwise we feel end up lo losing it, we won't be, uh, succeed in an uh, artistic way. Thank you very much.